Welcome to the New Books Network. This is Carrie Lynn Evans welcoming you back to New Books and Secularism, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. Today, I'm talking to sociologist and professor Phil Zuckerman about the new second edition of his book, Society Without God, What the Least Religious Nations Can Tell Us About Contentment. As he points out, religious conservatives around the world often claim that a society without a strong foundation of faith would necessarily be an immoral one, bereft of ethics, values, and meaning. Indeed, the Christian right in the United States has argued that a society without God would be hell on earth. In his book, Zuckerman challenges these claims. Drawing on fieldwork and interviews with more than 150 citizens of Denmark and Sweden, among the least religious countries in the world, he shows that far from being inhumane, crime-infested, and dysfunctional, highly secular societies are healthier, safer, greener, less violent, and more democratic and egalitarian than highly religious ones. Society Without God provides a rich portrait of life in a secular society, exploring how a culture without faith copes with death, grapples with the meaning of life, and remains content through everyday ups and downs. Phil Zuckerman is an Associate Dean and Professor of Sociology and Secular Studies at Pitzer College in Claremont, California. He's also a regular affiliated professor at Claremont Graduate University, and he's been a guest professor for two years at the University of Aarhus, Denmark. In 2011, Phil founded the first Secular Studies Department in the nation, He regularly writes for Psychology Today, Huffington Post, and numerous scholarly journals, and his books have been translated and published in Danish, Farsi, Turkish, Chinese, Korean, and Italian. He joins me today from sunny California to tell us about his new book. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to New Books in Secularism. My name's Carrie Lynn Evans, and I'm joined today by Phil Zuckerman to talk about the new second edition of his book, Society Without God. Phil, thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So I'd like to start by asking you a little bit about yourself and how you came to work in your field. Yeah, let's see. I'm about, I'm 51. Uh, I was born in Southern California in a little town on the beach between Santa Monica and Malibu. Uh, I <clears throat> grew up there. I then moved to Oregon, spent about nine or 10 years in Oregon. I have lived in Scandinavia for two years, uh, visit a lot. And how I, the second one was how I got interested in. Uh, In your field. Um, That's interesting. Uh, Well, my broader field is sociology. So I didn't know what I wanted to major in. So when I was in college, I would just sort of look at the course offerings and take classes that interested me. So I wasn't thinking about a major and I just, Oh, this looks interesting. This looks interesting. This looks interesting. Oh yes, yes, yes. And I guess I was interested in contemporary issues and race, class and gender and social movements. And so by the time I was a, what we call a junior here, like um, I had to meet with a counselor and she's like, you haven't declared a major. And I said, well, do I have to do that? She's like, well, let's look at what you've taken. And she's like, Oh, (laughs) looks like you're a sociology major. And, but, um, I was always fascinated in religion specifically um, since the time I was young, actually. Uh, uh, it really came to a head when I had my first, when I met, I had my first serious girlfriend who was the uh, daughter of an evangelical pastor and I went to church and I, you know, I just, I was always like kind of not compelled by it, but a little bit like what's going on here. You know, I was raised in a very secular, non-religious home uh, all four of my grandparents were non-believers of different stripes. My parents were non-believers of different stripes. So even though we had strong community ties to the Jewish community, that was more of an ethnic connection, a uh, cultural connection. So um, I was really interested in religion. And when, you know, when you're interested in religion, there's a lot, heck of a lot to study. You can study the history of religion, the philosophy of religion, you know, anthropology study, st- the, the discipline of anthropology sort of began by studying religion. Uh, you can study religious studies for, for, for Pete's sake. And um, it was only well into my career as a young sociology professor st- with a focus on religion that I started to realize no one was studying the secular, secular people, secular culture secularism in the past, uh, atheism, agnosticism, humanism, rationalism, existentialism, skepticism. I mean, you know, yeah, you could take a little philosophy class here or there, but it wasn't a robust discipline by any stretch of the imagination. 
And that's kind of, that was about, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago. And ever since I've been focused on the secular, secular people, secular culture, past and present. Fantastic. So tell us maybe how you came to write this particular book. Uh, so I, um, let's see, how can I, I, several things came together. So first of all, I always kind of had an irrational love of Scandinavia. And the reason I call that irrational is because, you know, <laughs> compare Denmark to Italy on just about anything. You know, Italy's got better food, better weather, <laughs> friendlier people, um, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, but I've always been drawn to the Nordic uh, world. I dream about it. I'm compelled by the literature that comes out of the Nordic world, the cinema that comes out of the Nordic world, uh, the politics that come out of the Nordic world. So I've always been interested in, in, in welfare social democracy and the sort of Olaf Palme and the creation of the welfare state. And I, I had to hate to say it, but I like woods, I like fjords, I like mountains, and I like peace and quiet. <laughs> and I don't like uh, violence, and I don't like stress, and I don't like... So anyway, I've always loved the Nordic realm, and I'd visited many times when I was young, backpacking uh, with friends and girlfriends and so on and so forth. Okay, fast forward to... Uh, wow, when, was, when were those days when we had George W. Bush Jr. as our president? It seems like a lifetime ago. Uh, ever 20 since years the, ago. Yeah, yeah, 20 years ago. Okay, you know. So he was the president, and everybody at that time started talking about like values voters here in the States, like, oh, he won because of all the values voters. And all that really meant was, you know, people that were opposed to women's reproductive rights and people that were opposed to homosexual rights. Somehow that was construed or misconstrued as a value. Uh, to me, you know, a woman's right to an abortion is a value and uh, people's right to live freely and marry who they want and love who they want and raise what kids they want, regardless of sex or gender, is a, is a value. But anyway, people were talking about values voters and everybody here in the States always talks about how, you know, Religion is the source of morals, and a society without religion would be chaos and hell, and a society without God would be, you know, just, uh, you know, just depraved and crime-ridden. And, and I was like, wait a minute, um, that's not actually the case. And I had been asked actually to write a chapter for the Cambridge Companion to Atheism about like, you know, what countries had uh, uh, the largest atheist populations and how many atheists are out there in the world. And so here I am like writing that chapter, looking at surveys from survey data from all over the world as best that I could find and hearing Americans, uh, sorry, you know, people from the U S talking about like, you know, Oh, uh, you know, you gotta have, you know, if religion goes away, society falls apart. And I was like, actually the most highly secularized society today, the most highly secularized democracies, uh, that have become secular organically, not through Soviet or communist coercion, but have just naturally and organically become secular, are actually the most moral, humane, and successful and prosperous societies on planet Earth. And so I had a sabbatical. I said, you know what? I want to go live in Scandinavia, and I want to do a kind of on-the-ground research. I want to interview people. I want to live there. I want to have, you know, my wife is going to have a baby there. Our kids are going to go to school there. And we're going to immerse ourselves in Nordic society so that have, I can have an even richer understanding of here is a nation or nations that are among the most secular in the history of humanity, uh, and yet they're among the most um, prosperous, peaceful, egalitarian progressive, human, moral, and uh, societies on earth. So I wanted my fellow North Americans to know this. Sounds good. So I thought maybe you could begin by telling us more about the Scandinavian countries in general. Like what's like, what is life like there, for example? Ah, uh, well, everybody's happy and the birds don't <laughs> shit. Um, <laughs> and all the croissants are buttered perfectly. No, um, it's not that there are no problems in the Nordic nations. Of course there are. Um, I used to have this colleague, uh, Lars, and we would walk to lunch together. And I was sort of, you know, I was loving everything about Scandinavia. And I was always, oh, look at this. And he was, you know, he's a Swede. And he's very critical of certain aspects of the Nordic world. And he said to me, Phil, you, you, you just, you're like in love. You're, you're, you have an irrational love here. And you're looking at everything through rose colored glasses. And, and you don't see the problems that exist here. And I'd say, well, Lars, tell, tell me some of the problems. And he would start to talk. Well, did you see yesterday there was a, a break, a burglary here and someone got, you know, someone got punched and off their bike and now they have concussion. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, and there's racism, you know, the immigrants are being discriminated against. I'm like, yeah. And he's like, and there's, it's not perfectly equal between men and women. And I'm like, yeah. And everything he said, I was like, Lars, all those problems are just worse everywhere else. So it's not that there are no problems in Scandinavia. It's just that they're a lot 
sharper and more discussed, you know, more potent everywhere else. So that was the way, uh, but we, you know, he wasn't convinced. Um, I personally, as a, you know, white past, I actually, I wasn't always seen as white. People often ask me where I was from, especially if I didn't shave. I think people often thought I was an immigrant from perhaps uh, an Arabic nation um, or maybe from Yugoslavia. And in fact, a lot of the immigrants, the Kurds used to think that I was like a fellow Muslim. So that was kind of fun. Got a discount on pizza one time. He said, he said to me, we have it hard here, don't we, after 9-11? I was like, yeah. But generally, as, as a, you know, an employed person uh, living on university housing uh, for most of the time, then we got other places. I found life there extremely, extremely wonderful. Uh, my kids went to fantastic public schools. As I said, my, my son was born there, so we got to experience the healthcare system, which was incredible and wonderful and free. Uh, the bike lanes are wonderful. The It's a clean society. There's not a lot of garbage and trash and filth like there is here in the United States. Um, pe- it's a calmer society. It's a um, it's a more private culture. People tend to stick to themselves. But if you have an inn, uh, people open up and can be very warm. There's a, a deep warmth and coziness that's there uh, if you can if you can tap into it. Uh, I find I find life in, and I've you know like I said I I've lived there for two years I visit frequently I st- while there are many problems right now that rack Scandinavia I still find them to be among the most um, wonderful places on planet Earth where people have basic needs met everybody has decent health care everybody has access to housing everybody has access to food everybody has access to education and there's just a sense of well being that pervades. Uh, and again, not to say that there aren't problems, but uh, you know, what can I say? I love it. And I love the food. <laughs> so you've already alluded to uh, a continuing comparison with the United States here. So I wanted to spend a little time fleshing out, particularly the conservative Christian claim that you've also already alluded to. And uh, especially in the United States, which is this idea that you really can't have a peaceful, ethical society without belief in God or religion. So I was hoping you could tell us how this argument goes for any listeners fortunate enough to not already be familiar with this refrain. <laughs> Shout out to British Columbia. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. To, what I would say is that it is almost a sort of taken for granted truth in the United States that <clears throat> religion is the source of morality that God is the sort of source of our rights. I have, I have a student in my class right now who thinks that, you know, our democratic system ultimately stems from God. Uh, and I said, well, do you have any evidence? And she's like, well, yes, the Bible says we are all created in God's image. So therefore democracy. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's a weird way of understanding things. And, you know, I, I quoted Guido Sarducci who said, well, if we're all made in God's image, then why aren't we invisible? But anyway, I digress. <laughs> so, uh, You know, the point is that politicians, Supreme Court justices, elementary school teachers, police officers, and your neighbors have a sort of taken for granted idea that um, it is religion that keeps people civil, that keeps people good, that is the source of our rights, even though the fundamental foundation of U.S. society is the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. But let's just take the Bill of Rights. None of those can be found in the Bible, the Torah, the Quran, the Book of Mormon. And I always say that to my students. I'm like, what do you mean? What do you mean we get our rights from God? Where, where does God speak about freedom of speech, government by the consent of the governed, right to assembly? I mean, it's just freedom of the press. Like all our constitutional rights, which I do love, uh, come from humans. Um, so anyway, the idea is it's, it's almost like a scare tactic. It's almost like if we stop being religious, if we stop worshiping God, you know, all hell will break loose. There will be crime. There will be drugs. I mean, every single day. Just, just, just last week, Tommy Tuberville, the new elected governor of California. I think he's a governor. No, maybe he's a senator in, in a state down south, Georgia, South Carolina. I'm not sure. And he's just like, oh, all the problems we have, we need to pray. Like drug overdosing, it's because we're not praying hard enough. Gun violence, it's because we're not praying hard enough. I mean, every freaking, you know, every freaking problem that we confront, there's quickly going to be a politician or a governor. Well, that's a politician. But I mean, a politician in power who's going to say it all stems from a lack of faith in God. And if we could just be more. And a lot of our, um, it's not just politicians. A lot of our poorer, lower class people buy into this as well. A lot of our church going 
uh, people who are working class, poor class, who are suffering, who don't have access to good health care, who don't have access to good education, who don't have safe neighborhoods, they also think, oh, it's just about God. If we could just, you know, they have bumper stickers like pray for America, you know, blah, blah, blah. So that's, that's a major, major trope here in the United States. I think it's on the ropes. I think it's starting to be questioned because so many of you people in the U.S. are um, – are you know walking away from religion and, and secularism is on the rise, but I, I, it's still a battle that has to be waged. I constantly have to argue with people about this idea that you know religion and God are somehow the sources of a healthy society when it's just simply not true. Right. Uh, and another topic religious folks routinely bring up is the fear of death. And they tell us that, you know, there's no atheists in foxholes, this kind of thing. Right. And so you say that uh, in your interview with a couple of Danes, uh, they really stood out to you because of the way um, they characterize the Scandinavian attitude towards this idea of the fear of death. So what did you learn from them? Yeah, I think it's almost a sort of, t- again, another taken for granted almost myth that you'll hear if you study religion is that, well, you know, why are people religious? Because, well, everybody's esca- everybody's fear is death. Everybody's scared to die. And we all face illness and suffering and we all face our own mortality. Um, I-, I think it was Peter Berger, the great uh, 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 Austrian-American sociologist of religion who had this great phrase that said, like, you know, religion is so strong because it it is, you know, it, 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 it basically provides an answer to, the, to our fear of death. Freud agreed as well. And so, again, that was sort of taken for granted. But when I looked at some of the s- surveys, I found that a huge chunk of Scandinavians don't believe in life after death. And they're living just fine. In other words, they are not racked with existential fear all day long. They are not, you know, de- you know held down by this kind of like, you know, ever constant worry about, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. Some, sure. No one wants to get a a diagnosis that they have cancer and have a year to live. But the vast majority seem to accept that, you know, everything that lives dies. So I interviewed many, many Danes and Swedes, some who had cancer, some whose own children had died, some whose spouses had died, many whose parents had died, many who were old themselves, who had a much more, I think the word is sanguine, I'm not sure, but a much more accepting orientation to death. And they were doing just fine. So again, I I don't want to oversell this. I don't want to be like, ah, nobody cares and nobody gets sad and nobody gets worried. But those things are fleeting. They're not constant. Uh, And I think that's the case for a lot of us, actually. And I just tried to highlight it in Scandinavia and say, look, this lack of a belief in life after death doesn't create widespread despondency and apathy or fear or anguish. People are living fine lives the best they can, uh, having families, engaged in their work, engaged in politics, engaged in art. Um, you know, and I was just trying to, I was trying to counter again that taken for granted almost myth that like everybody's afraid to die, and that's why religion will never go away because as long as we're aware of our own mortality, we need answers, and it's like. Eh, not really. Um, so that's what I was, yeah, that's what I was trying to focus there. And, and I met, like I said, many, many Danes who had a very accepting orientation towards uh, the fact that they may not exist one day. I had one guy say, oh gosh, the thought of existing forever is even worse. What a nightmare. <laughs> and uh, Martin Hagelin's book uh, called This Life really speaks to that if you're interested. Right. And and so this is kind of closely related to philosophical ponderings on the meaning of life as well. People will often tell you that um, understanding their own life in some kind of broad tapestry of God's plan for them is the only thing that can bring meaning to life. So what did you find in the Scandinavian countries with regard to that question? People certainly found meaning outside of a framework of God. No question about it. Yeah, this was yet again another, I guess I, I really was trying to buff some myths, be, be they political myths or academic myths. And yeah, another academic myth is, you know, okay, they'll say, well, people are religious because they fear death. And if it's not that, they say, well, people are religious because it gives their lives meaning. That, that is true for a lot of people. I don't deny that many, many people derive, derive tremendous meaning from their faith, from their religious identity. Uh, no doubt about it. But the idea that it's the only source of meaning, the idea that people need religion or they won't or they'll have a meaningless existence is simply not it's not supported by the data, the anthropological sociological data, which shows that a significant chunk of humanity 
can find meaning outside of a religious or theological framework. And so what I found was in, in the Nordic nations, people just were kind of oblivious to religion and God. They, they weren't even hard atheists. They weren't anti-religion. It just had very, very little meaning in their lives, which is a truly more truly secular state actually than a hard atheism. I mean, if you're if you're really, really having to declare that you don't believe in God all the time, that means you're thinking about it all the time. But if it's just not on your on your daily calendar, it's truly removed from your day-to-day life. And so what I find is, yes, of course, everybody at certain times ponders the meaning of existence. I don't know how you couldn't. I mean, you look at the stars, you look at rat poop, and you think, what is this all? Um, but those moments, for, for the people that those moments are long lasting, they tend to major in philosophy, right? But for most of us, they're fleeting. And we have to think about, oh, shit, the neighbor's dog is barking again, or, oh, man, we're out of milk, or, you know, does she love me? Or what's this thing on my, you know, on my knee? Or, you know, oh, I forgot to crawl grandma, or my deadline at work is due. In other words, most of us are living in the here and now. And so what I found amongst, amongst the other neighbors, you know, I asked them that, I'm like, well, where do you find meaning? And they, it was, it's, it's no surprise, right? They find meaning in relationships with other humans, which, you know, is ultimately people love Groundhog Day, the movie with uh, Bill Murray. And that, that's a very secular film, which suggests that you actually find ultimate meaning by connecting with your fellow humans. Nothing else works, not even, uh, you know, thinking you're a god. But anyway, they find meaning in their connections with others, be it family or friends or colleagues. Uh, they find meaning through their labor and their work and their professions. They find meaning through the arts. They find meaning through nature and communing with nature. They find meaning uh, through uh, TV shows and movies they watch, and they find meaning in their, you know, morning coffee or their after dinner coffee, and they find meaning in the cycles of the seasons. I mean, they find meaning in everything that we can find meaning in. They just don't find meaning in a magical sky daddy. Well put. Um, so I wanted to go to the next myth that you bust in your book. Um, and this is the idea that uh, religiosity is somehow in innate or psychologically necessary condition for human beings. And so just like what you're talking about, your experience with people for whom thinking about religion wasn't even on the daily calendar, um, can you talk a little bit more about this and how that persuaded you that that this is another myth? Yeah, thank you. There's a, there's a deep uh, well of voices in my discipline, particularly the sociology of religion, never mind the psychology of religion, good grief, that positions or, or, or frames religion as some kind of innate, almost inborn, right? Justin Barrett said we're born believers. <laughs> he described atheism as unnatural. Christian Smith describes being secular as like crab walking backwards, like it can be done, but it goes against the very grain of our nature and is counterproductive or you know not going to be very fruitful in the long run. Uh, Peter Berger said that uh, life without religion is just not going to work. It's not, it goes against our nature. Uh, Andrew Greeley said the same things that religious needs never change among humans. So yes, there's a, there's a huge group of people, psychologists, evolutionary psychologists and sociologists who sort of somehow think that the natural state of humans is religious. And so atheism can only come about through some kind of perverted intellectual elitism or the barrel of a Soviet gun or something. And barring those things, the natural state of humans is religious. And I just believe that data doesn't support that. We have hundreds and millions of people who are not religious. We have evidence of atheism, skepticism, agnosticism, humanism, going all the way back to recorded times from the ancient Charvaka and Lokoyata of ancient India to ancient China, uh, ancient uh, India, I already mentioned India, ancient Rome, ancient Greece. I mean, whatever we have written records, even in the ancient writings of the Hebrews, you can find skepticism, atheism, agnosticism right there. It's right there. It's easy to see. Um, I mean, start with Ecclesiastes and go down the line to Book of Job, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is that, or even even in the in the Psalms, when it says, you know, the atheist says in his heart, there is no God, he's a fool. Well, that suggests there were atheists back then. So hello. So I would argue that the historical record speaks of the always having non-believers. The current demographic data speaks of this. But not only are there, you know, millions of people, hundreds of millions of people who aren't religious, there are now societies that are a majority secular, where religion is the minority position. I'm thinking of the Scandinavian nations, Estonia, Czech Republic, South Korea, Japan, um, the Netherlands, um, um, 
you have some S- Scotland where the vast majority now, 60%, 65%, 70% are non-believers and do not identify with religion. So it's a little bit weird for me to consider all these people, you know, unnatural mutations, actually. One of the theorists I read the other day called, called atheism, you know, a mutation of our human nature. So um, by documenting the Nordic nations, I was simply trying to say, it's very hard to live here and think all these people are living unnaturally against the grain of human nature. Uh, it's just not so. And we know that religion is the engine of religion is socialization, right? You're, if you're raised by religious people, that's how religion gets reproduced and sustained. And that's been the case for centuries. And now that we're finally having enough, you know, a critical mass of people who aren't raising their kids religious, you're going to see more and more of humanity secular. Sorry, Justin Barrett and Christian Smith. I mean, I guess you can laugh at me when I'm burning in hell, but it's just not the case. <laughs> So you contrast uh, the Scandinavians' nonchalant attitude about their non-belief with the oftentimes really traumatic fallout for Americans who experience losing their faith. So can you tell us about your thoughts on this? So I always, I think it's best to recognize that secularity and religiosity are always in a somewhat of a dialectical dance, right? Like they get, they only make sense in the face of each other. And what I mean by that is, you know, what it means to be secular often then begs the question of, well, what does it mean to be religious? In other words, what is it that a person is not believing in? Or, and it's not that secularity is a purely negative stance, right? You could frame secularity as having a naturalistic worldview, right? As opposed to not believing in the supernatural. So if you say not believing in the supernatural, that's a sort of negation. But if you say, oh, I, 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 I maintain a naturalistic view of the world, that's a, that's a more positive orientation. But the point here is that wherever, whatever, like, like secularity in Israel has a particular flavor because it's in, in in dialogue or in debate with religion in Israel. Secularism is going to be different in in Vancouver than it is in Quebec, given the religious cultures of those places. And secularism is going to be different in India, given you know. So wherever you are, the the, the religion of that society and the religious history and heritage of that society is going to shape and affect the secularity. So if you live in a society where most people are religious, religion is a very important part of people's lives and identities. And everybody thinks you have to be religious in order to be moral. And everybody thinks you have to be religious in order to be good. And I'm talking about certain parts of the United States. Then if you reject that religion, there's going to be major consequences. Your rejection of that religion, first of all, is going to cause problems with your family, your friends, probably at work as well. I can't tell you how many people from the United States um, I have interviewed who do not share that they're secular at work because their colleagues would flip out. They, they fear losing their jobs. Um, and so what happens is to be non-religious in the United States, again, it's regional. It might be no big deal in Eugene, Oregon, but it's a huge deal in, you know, uh, North Carolina, you know, in Sumter, South Carolina. Um, and in that instance, your, your secularity is very defensive. It's very well thought and articulated because you have to know your shit. Um, it's very much, a, it can be a problem. You can, suffer tremendously emotionally, socially. I've interviewed people who, when they lost their faith, uh, lost their family, lost their friends, and went into terrible depressions. So um, when you read the narratives, for example, of apostates, people who rejected their religion in the United States, it's a very fraught journey. It's a very uh, a troubling and, and a journey. But in Scandinavia, where there's not much strong faith, almost nobody goes to church, religion is a sort of quaint, you know, marginal aspect of the culture uh, that's just something your grandparents do or some, you know, then when you lose your faith, you may never have had a very strong faith to begin with. So that transition is not that big of a deal. You're not going to be attacked for it or defended. In fact, to be quite serious, it was often the opposite. I interviewed people who, if they were religious, experienced um, sort of criticisms and critiques. And, you know, I interviewed a woman who was religious in college. And when she expressed it, you know, everybody kind of jumped on her like, what are you a fucking idiot? I interviewed um, a, a person, a man who, who didn't want to tell his best friend that he believed in God because he was scared his best friend would, you know, stop being his best friend. So it's almost the obverse of what you find in the United States. Uh, you find in Scandinavia where the norm is to basically not care too much about religion, not think too much about it. Certainly you don't think it's the source of your morality or meaning in life. Um, so the religio- the secularity in Scandinavia is a much more calm, um, less defensive, and less virulent form of secularity. 
Yeah, so let's drill down further into what it actually means to live a secular lifestyle. You mentioned that until fairly recently, this has been an understudied question, but that your investigation has led you to identify three basic categories of secular attitude, which you call the first one, reluctance or reticence, the second one, benign indifference, and then finally, utter obliviousness. So (laughs) can you tell us about these? Yeah. So now to be clear, this is really grounded in my my field work in Scandinavia. So I wouldn't say those are the three sort of forms that one might find in Colombia or Canada or New Zealand or Indonesia or whatever, you know, I mean, or Vietnam. Um, I, I'm, I was specifically kind of uh, uh, talking about what I found in Scandinavia. And, and, and you're absolutely right. Like when I set out to do my study, there was no, there was not a book I could read about. No one had ever done this. Gone. Not, I'm not trying to toot my own horn here. I'm actually just talk, trying to talk about like my methodology. Like no one had done um, a kind of qualitative ethnographic exploration of secular identity. Sure, there were books about atheism, which are, you know, pontificating atheism, which are just like, you know, debunking arguments for the existence of God. That's not what I was interested in. And I wasn't interested in like, why is there no God? Or I was interested in people who live their lives without religion. And it was sort of like, I didn't know where to begin. How do you study the absence of something, right? Like, what do I sit down and be like, so tell me what you don't believe in. Tell me what, you know, how does this all work? What, what am I looking at? Is it all just a deficit or what? So um, it was tricky. And what I found, though, after interview, after interview, after interview, which usually started with a conversation about religion, and from there I could you know, explore other aspects of meaning and life and death and morals and sex and love and all these things that you can talk about with people. And so, yeah, I kind of, after my first year of research, I sort of saw these three patterns. Like you could kind of classify most Scandinavians as one of these three. So the first one was reticence and reluctance. So what I found was most Nordic people don't like talking about religion. They find it far too personal, far too sensitive. Like I had people who, when I was done with the interview, said to me, I've never talked about these things before, not even with my spouse. I was like, what? You know, like, and, and, and they, people said to me, we'll talk about sex easier. We'll talk about money. You want to talk about my finances? You want to, but when you ask me about God and religion, it suddenly feels very, very um, personal and private. So the first thing I noticed was there was a real reluctance. It was hard to get people talking. It was almost like, I couldn't, but but it wasn't that they had deep, deep thoughts about it that they were afraid to share. It was just more like, hmm, this is a place I don't really go to, so I don't. I'm a little bit reluctant to go there, and I'm a little reticent. I don't have much to say. That was one kind of pattern I saw. The next one was what I would call, um, you know, utter, oh no, benign indifference. So what that was was again, in contrast to a lot of secular people in the United States. Um, what I found was there was a kind of people, the average Scandinavian was like indifferent to religion and if anything, had a kind of benign orientation. They were like, it's fine. It's nice. Like they weren't out to debunk it. Oh, it's bullshit. It's, they exploit people and it's full of lies and they're, you know, it's a pedophile ring or like they, you know, it's bad for women's rights or like they didn't have the standard criticisms that you hear among Amer- uh, U.S. atheists. What, what I heard was a kind of like, oh, religion's nice. <laughs> the church is nice. Do you ever go there? Well, maybe once in a while, but not really. Um, oh, the priest is, she's very nice. It's always a woman. Now, um, the, the priesthood has become uh, feminized there, which is an interesting uh, sociological phenomenon. But, but so there was almost this kind of like quaintness, like the way they talked about religion, the way they might talk about like record players or bookstores, like, oh yeah, they're nice. I mean, I never go to one. I don't have one. And I don't even know if they're around anymore, but you know, I have an uncle who has a Victrola or something like that. And I I found that really interesting again, because most of the non-believers and non-religious people I, I grew up with, like they have very strong feelings about religion that are often more negative than positive. So again, this spoke to a kind of like truly secular state where religion isn't even something to fear. Religion isn't something that has to be debunked. And then finally, I would say, um, the last one was utter obliviousness. And this was really remarkable. Like if someone were to say to me, like, well, did you learn anything there that you, you didn't expect? Like this was it. Like I had never met people who had absolutely no preformed thoughts about these questions. I, I'll give you one example. I was on a train going from Copenhagen to Aarhus. It's about a three or four hour 
ride depending on which train you get. And I found myself in a compartment with three Swedish uh, physical therapists. They were going to a conference in Aarhus. They were from Stock. Uh, they were from, I think, Malmo. And so we started talking. I had my tape recorder. I had my notepad. And they were, you know, I finally was like, well, you know, they're like, well, what do you do? You know, what are you here? Oh, I'm doing research. Oh, what's it about? And I finally was like, well, you guys want to let me interview you? And they're like, sure. And I remember, um, so I said, well, let's start, you know, let, let me get a sense here. Like, are you, are you religious? Are you Christian? And they all kind of like, well, yeah, sure. I mean, to them, Christian is just kind of like an ethnic identity marker, right? To be Danish, to be Swedish is kind of to be Christian, sort of. And then I said, well, do you believe in God? And, and one, of these, one of the women who was in her 30s said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, do you believe in God? I just, I'm trying to get a sense of where you're at. And she said, huh, I've never thought about that before. Let me think about it. And we just said, okay. And she looked out the window of the train. And we just sort of sat there quietly for about five minutes. And then she looked back and said, no. And it was like, you're th- in your 30s and you've, you don't, you, you'd never um, come down on, on, a, on that question before. So that's just illustrative of the kind of utter obliviousness I found where it, people literally were like, why are we talking about this? I never talk about this. I never think about it. And again, it, it, and it reminds me of a Professor Steve Bruce once said that the, the final stop on the train of secularization is not atheism. It's actually indifference. Meaning that, you know, in a truly secular society, people, it's not that they don't believe, it's that they don't even think about it. And um, I really came face to face with that. And that's not all Scandinavians, but it was a significant proportion. Well, and I think it makes sense, uh, according to something you mentioned earlier, that it's in dialogue with its opposite, basically, right? So there's not a lot to push back on um, in the Scandinavian countries, clearly, whereas it perhaps you find the most virulent outspoken um organized uh atheists in the united states because um because there's such a feeling like there is a battle enjoined in a way like you, exactly. you feel that there's a theocracy that's on the march exactly and yeah it's it's encroaching on people's rights and so um it does make sense that you'd see the most uh active reaction exactly. there yeah you got it So you also take on the very difficult question of why we're seeing such a rapid decline in belief of God, like around the world, Um, not just in the Scandinavian countries. Finally, the United States has kind of caught up with um, the Western world in terms of a decline in belief. So what are some of the factors that you think are at play here? Uh, I think there's kind of universal causes of secularization. And by universal, I mean... That if 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 this hap- if this occurs anywhere, you're going to see a, a a decrease of religion and an increase of secularization. And then I think there are you know society specific factors that might be unique to that particular society. You know that the Czech Republic's history of Jan Hus is going to be particularly significant in the Czech Republic, but not anywhere else. Or you know the uh, you know the the Vietnamese history of Buddhism is going to cause a certain have a certain influence. Um, so what I would say is that of those larger kind of universal sources, I'm going to go with Norris and Engelhart here that, you know, existential security by that, I don't mean phys- phys- philosophical existentialism. I mean, your existence, if your existence is secure, meaning if most people in a society have the basics that they need life, uh, they have housing and healthcare and food, that life is stable. There's a democracy. There's not a lot of chaos or crime or, you know, revolutions, there's not a lot of precariousness to life, that if, if life becomes more or less, right, we can't control everything, we're always going to get, people have strokes, and there's always an earthquake, and this and that, or a coronavirus, but barring these things that we just can't control, if, 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 if society is able to create enough stability, security, and safety, you will see religion go down, and I think that's the case anywhere. And you certainly see that in the Scandinavian societies, right, which have created the safest, most secure, and most prosperous nations the world has ever known, or industrialized nations the world has ever known. Next, I think education, right? The more people are educated, can read, that that's going to, that's gonna, I think, affect religiosity. The internet seems to affect religiosity. Uh, we can talk about why that is the case in more detail, but it seems like the more people have access to information, uh, it tends to erode religiosity. 
when women are out working in the paid labor force, that tends to erode religiosity. So the biggest factors I would say are those. Now, again, there's going to be society specific. So for example, there's been a huge reaction in the United States against the religious right. Like a lot of people who were sort of mainline middle of the road Christians are no longer identifying as Christian because they're having a political reaction against the religious right, the Christian right in this country. And that may not be the case in Uruguay, for example, which has also seen a huge uptick of secularity in the last 50 years. Um, it, sometimes uh, you, you can see secular, uh, a lot of people are reacting against the pedophile priest scandal. Uh, uh, in, in certain Catholic nations. Certainly that's been the case here in the United States, in Australia, Ireland. My goodness, I just read a book on Ireland secularizing. And I mean, the pedophile priest scandal, the nun, uh, the, the, they had these homes for you know pregnant teens where they were treated horribly and their children were uh, often forcibly removed and, and given to other people or killed and their bodies were hidden. So a lot of the scandals that have plagued the Irish Catholic Church are turning a lot of people off of religion. So I think, again, there are these common universal themes, and then there's idiosyncratic things that happen uh, in different societies that can cause it. But those would be the biggies off the top of my head. Sure. Um, so you frequently compare the religious attitudes in the Scandinavian countries to those in the United States. But I'm wondering, did you have a chance to discuss these comparisons with the Danes and the Swedes themselves? Did did you pick up on their impression of religiosity in oh, America? Oh, yeah. That was often, those were often some of my favorite conversations because many, many of the people that I interviewed had spent significant time in the States. Uh, my favorite were the ones who did like a year abroad in high school or college, you know, and were placed with the, an American family. And I mean, this, uh, is it okay to say American? I don't know what to call someone from the United States. I know that Canadians hate it when we do that. I don't know what to call a United States. Oh, in. I don't know. I, I think that's fine. Okay. Um, <laughs> when, when a United, when they would stay with a United States family and they would, um, I mean, this hor to them, they were just like horror stories, like, you know, that they were homophobic, that, I mean, I, we had a Danish uh, student stay with us for a year, and she was friends with another Danish student who was staying with another family up the road, and that family wouldn't let her go into the local record store here in my hometown because they told her it was satanic. I mean, you know, they were just, uh, I, I interviewed Swedes who, who had, who you know, maybe were working abroad in the U.S. for a while and made friends with their neighbors, and then the neighbors wouldn't let their kids go to the Natural History Museum because they said it was all lies and evolution was a lie. So I constantly heard stories uh, about the U.S. So yes, I was able to hear their own co comparing and contrasting, but probably the most significant was I had a very close colleague and friend, or who became a close colleague and friend, I should say. I didn't know her before I went, uh, Lena, Professor Lena Kuhl, who, who, um, who is actually a sociologist of religion like myself. And so we became good friends. Our kids were in preschool together. And then the year we came home, she ended up doing a sabbatical in California and came with her husband and family. So it was almost like trading places. Like, you know, me and my family were there for a year and then she and her family came here for a year and her husband had never been to the United States. And it was just riveting he, he, to hear his observations of religion here. And in fact, it had this, it, it made him, more secular. He was like, wow, I didn't know people took this stuff so seriously. I didn't know people were this nuts. I'm not this. And he went back to Denmark and actually quit his membership with the Danish <laughs> National Lutheran Church because he kind of got secularized here in the United States when he saw, you know, in, in Denmark, again, religion is sort of so quaint and powerless. Why would you be against it? But when he came here for a year, he was like, oh my God. And, and he even said to me, he's like, I need to tell my fellow Danes. I don't think they realize how crazy Americans are. Like they really don't believe in global warming they they really think you know prayer is the answer to gun violence and he was quite uh freaked out by it gosh so i wondered if your ability to see both of these cultures up so close has given you any insight or ideas into why the united states might continue to be so overtly religious when the other democratic nations around the world are increasingly secular and i know that there's a lot of scholars in a lot of fields writing about this quite a bit right now. But I just thought, what's what's your perspective on this with your special uh, experience? Yeah, that's a good question. I think if I had to, off the top of my head, I would say, um, not co totally off the top of my head. I know you sent me the questions ahead of time, listeners, so don't think I wasn't prepared. <laughs> um, I, I would say that, okay. Off the top, you know, right away, I'll, I'll go back to what I said. Well, here in the United States, we have uh, 
a huge uh, gap between the wealthy and the rich, I mean, and the poor. We have millions of people without health, basic health insurance, even people with health insurance. Uh, when you have an illness or whatever, you're going to pay tr- a tremendous amount. My wife had a stroke this year and with with excellent health insurance, I still had to pay $45,000 of my own out-of-pocket money just to get her basic health care from a stroke. Um, so we have a very precarious life here. There's guns everywhere. Uh, we have an extremely high murder rate here. Uh, we have So we have this tremendous inequality, class inequality, which uh, intersects with racial inequality. And we have... Um, you know, so life is hard here in the United States. Hey, if you're rich, it's a, it's a, it's Disneyland, but most people aren't rich here. And so I think it's this, it's the classic, you know, exactly what, what Marx and Norris and Englehart said that when life is precarious and hard, people are going to turn to faith. Um, we also are so multi-ethnic and multi-racial and multi-identity that for many people, religion is a huge part of their identity and community. Certainly that's the case for African Americans. It's often the case for Asian Americans, depending on which country they come from. It's usually the Koreans that go to church, um, but Chinese as well. Japanese, not so much, but they might get involved in their local Buddhist temple. Um, uh, Latinos turn to the church uh, for identity. So you have a lot of, um, when you have that, much, you know, we're a land of immigrants. And for many of us, religion becomes something to cling to as a sense of community and identity. So you have a precarious, unequal, crime-ridden society. You have, you know, a lot of diversity. Um, we also have, you know, a history of, of Christianity and our founding with the Puritans. So I would say those are probably the biggest factors for me. Um, that said, <laughs> religion is, is, is decreasing right now. So it'll be interesting to see where we're at in 20 or 30 years. Mm-hmm. Well, Phil, I've taken up a lot of your time. I know you've got uh, some sports to get off and do. So uh, I want to thank you very much for agreeing to come on the show this morning. But before we go, tell us what you're currently working on. Oh, yeah. So I'm working on a book on, surprise, surprise, secularization. It's called Beyond Doubt, uh, Secularization in Society. With Ryan, I'm working on it with Ryan Cragen and Isabella Castle Strand. And uh, we actually just got our contract signed with NYU Press. Um, and we're just basically arguing that um, secularization is happening. It's widespread. It's undeniable. It's significant. And in many instances, it's following exactly along the lines that the early theorists of secularization theory posited that it would. So it's a little bit of an internal argument. We're fighting back against some of the other scholars in our field who uh, for the last 20 or 30 years said, oh, secularization is a myth that never really happened. Secularization theory is dead. And we're like, "Uh, no, it's not. Let's look at the data. So that's what we're working on right now. Can I ask you a question or is that not allowed? Sure. No, absolutely. When you look at the United States and Scandinavia, where would you place Canada? Are you closer to the U.S. or are you closer to Scandinavia in terms of like secularity and religiosity? I think we're closer to Scandinavia. I can really identify with the idea that, um, I mean, there's, there's, there's plenty of churches, especially more in different areas, but there's a lot of people for whom uh, they're either benevolent, um, mm-hmm. the the benevolent, uh, what did benign you call it? Di- benign yeah, that's, difference, yeah. That's right, where they have a feeling like it's just kind of whatever. So, um, it's Church is probably fine, you know, but they're not really all that interested. They might go uh, for Easter or Christmas or talk about going and then right. not actually go, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, and there's also a feeling that our neighbors to the South are crazy. So, uh, especially lately, but, um, just the, the way that they frame arguments about abortion and gay rights, as you mentioned, um, it, it just comes across as really extreme and strangely extreme for a developed country as well. It's terrifying. It is truly terrifying and they're armed, which makes it even more terrifying. Well, and that seems really strange to us up here as well. And you you mentioned BC in your book because you made the comment that BC is the most secular of of the Canadian provinces, and I actually grew up there. Okay. So, um, so it's possible, yeah, it's possible that my impression of that is different. So that was forty five percent people, I think, 
you said will say that they have no religion. Mm. And now I'm living in Quebec City, which is the home, uh, which has come up a couple of times on this show, but it's the home of uh, the post-Quiet Revolution where Quebecers had felt uh, in, in the mid-20th century that they were very oppressed and mm-hmm. by the church, and they were by the Catholic church. And you can see evidence of the Catholic schools and the lots and lots of the cathedrals everywhere. And they just mm-hmm. had enough. And they said, yeah. get out of our lives. Stop telling us how to have sex and how to have families and, and what to do with our relationships. And which is why, well, I think it's why, like when you get married here and, and people do not often get married, but when you do, mm-hmm. you don't take the, you don't take the last name of your spouse right. as a woman. So just some, right. but, and Quebec is a little bit of a unique enclave within the country as well. But yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's, interesting. that's my feeling. Yeah, it's funny. I, that's my background. And then I'm also from California originally. I'm very jealous. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's funny. Well, that's so interesting. My wife's dad was born in Canada, so I've been working all year trying to get her Canadian citizenship. So maybe we can just switch and you can come to California and we'll come up to Canada. <laughs> uh, visiting is fine. Yeah, my my husband will ask me once in a while, you sure you don't want to go back home? Like, oh, that's so oh, gosh. funny. Yeah, that's just so the funny. just the healthcare alone. Oh, but. yeah. No, yeah. I would. I love, I mean, to me, Canada is just fantastic. I want to move to Salt Spring Island and never look back. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if, yeah. If you're going to come move to Canada, um, the, yeah. fr- the Vancouver, uh, Fraser Valley, the lower Fraser Valley there, and yeah. the, the Juan, Juan de Fuca Islands and are just like the yeah. best. Yeah, so nice. Well, thanks for having me. I really It's been wonderful. It. Yeah. Thanks yeah. so much for being on the show. And hopefully uh, with your next book, Give Me a Ring, we'll have you back. Sounds great, Carrie Lynn. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I want to thank you for listening to New Books in Secularism, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. Once again, I'm Carrie Lynn Evans, and I've been speaking with Professor Phil Zuckerman about his new book, Society Without God, the Second Edition What the Least Religious Nations Can Tell Us About Contentment. If you enjoyed this podcast, please write us a positive review on iTunes, post about us on social media, or tell a friend. The New Books Network is a not-for-profit organization, so all the buzz you can help us generate goes a long way to supporting this work. I'm also interested in hearing from you about your thoughts on this podcast and the material we cover. Tell me about it. You can find me on Twitter at Carrie Linland. That's at C-A-R-R-I-E-L-Y-N-N-L-A-N-D. Do you have a book you'd like covered on one of our shows? Contact us through our website, newbooksnetwork.com. Also, be sure to like the New Books and Secularism channel on Facebook, where you'll see every time we post a new interview. In the meantime, I'll wish you an à la prochaine from Quebec. Until my next conversation about New Books in Secularism. (laughs) 